Well, interestingly enough, the uh, passage I would like to read this morning comes from the book we were looking at last week. Uh, we're, we're still not going to, we're not going to likely be in Acts until we get through the Reformation series. So what I'm doing is taking a theme from what we're going to be looking at tonight. And what I'm looking at here, what we're looking at is what was th basically the best within the Anabaptists, what actually motivated them. And we're not going to hear Bob Godfrey talking about this. Uh, this comes from other, another source, essentially John Gerstner's treatment of the Anabaptists and what it was that was really motivating them and everything that they decided to do. Although we are going to see, again, a lot of craziness and we can't say that was motivated by a desire for a pure church because some of the things they did were just wicked. But, but it wasn't all of them. It was just a segment of them. But it did contribute to their reputation. But what we're going to look at is their desire for a pure church. And I think you can see the connection. If you don't see it, hopefully you will by the time I'm done introducing this. But, but what I want to do is read a passage of Scripture. You know, um, maybe I could shorten it just, just to the text we're going to look at because time is getting away quickly. So how about Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25? And this is where our Lord is, well, where Paul uh, is telling us about how Jesus loved his church and how that's to be the pattern for husbands to love their wives. Now, I don't want to focus this morning on this as, a, a, as the example for husbands. What I want us to look at is why Jesus came into the world, because that's what it tells us here. And I think you'll see it, it, it's reflecting the theme we're looking at this morning and what it was, again, that some of the Anabaptists were after. So beginning in verse 25, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Okay, that, that's what we want to focus on this morning. Christ's goal for his church is what our goal should be for his church, for ourselves and for the corporate body. Now, last week, remember, we saw that <clears throat> as the Reformation continued to progress, uh, reforming movements began to rise throughout Europe, such as Martin Bucer's in Strasbourg and Ulrich Zwingli's in Zurich, and that attempts were made by Bucer to unite these movements, also later by John Calvin, we're, we're going to see. There was, however, one group that uh, arose that didn't want union uh, with these others, they wanted to remain separate because they believed these others were in error, and they were called the Anabaptists. Now, first off, we should, uh, we should make sure we don't confuse the Anabaptists with, with the Baptists, right, with the, the, the Baptist movement. The uh, Baptist movement didn't really arrive on the scene until the next century. It's something that actually came out of English Puritanism. They adopted virtually everything the, the Reformers did, the Puritans did, except they they didn't agree with the baptism of infants. Now, the Anabaptists, getting back to this group, have been called the Radical Reformation. Radical because, um, you know, in, in uh, comparison to Lutherans and Calvinists, Lutherans were considered to be the most conservative group coming out of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and, and Calvinists second with regard to how much change they were actually attempting, you know, to bring about from the status quo. The Anabaptists weren't conservative at all. They were, they were radicals. They wanted much more extensive reform. And because of this, they were seen as a danger to the Reformation. Now, the title Anabaptist means, as you know, re-baptizers. And it's a name that was given to them. Not, they didn't take it to themselves. They didn't say, we're the people who re-baptize other people. But it was given to them by their opponents. They didn't view themselves this way. Because they rejected infant baptism, you know, which was accepted by all, every other segment of the church, they saw themselves actually baptizing any individual uh, who professed faith in Christ for the first time. Now, they came to this view, not surprisingly, by reading the Bible. 
okay, which had been, been made widely available courtesy of Martin Luther. I mean, this is what Luther wanted. But as they read the Bible, they didn't see infant baptism mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. They saw it rather as a leftover from the Roman church, where the Reformers saw it as the continuation of, of God's mercy towards His covenant people and His children. The Reformers considered what the Anabaptists had to say on this point, their, their objections, but they saw all these indications in the New Testament of the continuance of God continuing to deal with the children of believers. Now, again, their great desire, the Anabaptists, was that for a pure church, you know, free from those that, that, that aren't true believers. And, you know, the Reformers wanted this as well. Sometimes we, we tend to think they didn't. But in the case of the Anabaptists, they saw the great problem as that of infant baptism. They saw that standing in the way. Now, not only did they consider the Lutheran view of infant baptism, which sadly was baptismal regeneration, problematic. And we were looking at that last week, remember, after the, um, we watched the video, we began reading the Catechisms of Luther, uh, where he believed that, you know, no, water can't save you. But if you add the Word of God to the water, then it becomes a regenerating, basically, work of God. Now, Luther tended to do that also with the Lord's Supper. He tended to do that with the Word. He believed that Christ is added to all of these things, and it makes them saving ordinances. Well, they believed that that water, Luther believed that water, and today Lutherans believe that the Word of God added to the water brings about the conversion of infants. Well, they saw that as problematic because, as a matter of fact, it doesn't convert infants. But they also saw the practice of infant baptism as a whole since it inevitably led to viewing children as elect and regenerate. In their opinion, that led to the corruption of the church because it allowed someone to become a member of the church without having to profess faith in Christ. Now, as I said before, this led them to a dangerous conclusion, and this is what got them into trouble. Um, and the Reformers saw it, and of course the state saw it as well. If Christianity is nothing more than a movement of individuals joined to Christ, if it wasn't something that could encompass families, if families could not be a part of the church, then how could society be a part of the church? How could you have a state church where basically we are a Christian nation? And if that isn't possible, how can the church continue in the relationship it now has with the state? The two should be separate. But if you eliminate that, then what about the military power of the state on which the Reformation depended? Because that in their estimation, went with this relationship. Now, I think it, from this, it's easy to see how the Anabaptists became a thorn in the sides, not only of the Lutherans and the Reformed, but Rome as well. You know, everyone hated the Anabaptists because they were threatening the support on which all three of these movements were actually relying. And this leads us to another reason why they were given the name Anabaptist. You know, again, why their enemies put that label on them. Because under the Justinian Code, which was formulated by the Emperor Justinian in the 6th century, which was still in force in that day, those who rebaptized were considered outside the law. That means they were an outlaw. That's what outlaw means, outside the law. And that also means they were subject to death. Remember, Luther was declared an outlaw at the Diet of, of Worms. And anybody who found him anywhere on the road could kill him on the spot and take all his possessions. Well, that's what happened to the Anabaptists. And many of them were executed by the leaders of both Protestant and Roman, not churches, but the states. You know, we're going to learn a little bit later about um, Michael Servetus, who was actually an Anabaptist, and how part of the movement rejected Trinitarianism and how he was declared an outlaw, and how he was put on trial when he fled to Geneva, and he was actually burned at the stake, uh, Calvin being the prosecutor, but the state being the one who actually executed him. The state was in the business 
of executing those who were outlaws. And sadly, these were declared outlaws because of their belief system. So again, we have to remember the time. You know, we, we wouldn't do this today, you know. Um, but during those times, people were very concerned about the future of the Reformation and whether the true church was going to uh, continue. Now, they had other problems as well. We're going to see plenty of those this evening that led many people to believe that they were violent, that they were crazy, that they were seditious. And actually, if you look a little bit further into it, you, they were pretty crazy. Okay? Not all of them, some of them. But we need to remember the majority of them were not. Okay? Were not crazy. They were just simply seeking to live a New Testament Christian life. However, sadly, again, something Luther saw, they were a bit on the legalistic side. Now, this morning, I want us, as I've said before, to look at what was behind their convictions, and that is a desire for a pure church. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with that goal. The Reformers also, as I mentioned before, saw that this is what we should be striving for. But as John Gerstner saw it, the main error of the Anabaptists was not in desiring it, but in thinking that they had actually achieved it, and I'm, I'm thinking primarily by excluding children from, again, their place, as it were, in the, in, uh, in the visible church as a part of the church community. Now, it's not that they didn't let the children come to church. They brought them to church, but they just essentially viewed them in pretty much the same way that the Reformers did. It was just a question of how someone might tend to view a child if they practice infant baptism. I'm going to say a little bit more on that before we're done. But let's consider two things this morning. First of all, that we should strive for a pure church. That's clearly what the Bible teaches. But we do need to realize at the same time that we're not going to achieve it on this side of glory, you know, while we're here in this world, either personally or corporately. Now, first of all, we are to strive for a pure church. And I, I take that from our text. Now, in our text, Paul points husbands to Christ, to his love for his bride, as the model which we are to follow. Now, what is that model? He tells us that Jesus loved his church. He loved his bride. He loved us, okay? He loved us when he came into the world. He loved us from all eternity. That was what motivated him to do what he did next. Well, that love moved him, Paul says, to give himself, to lay down his life, uh, that we might be saved, right? And Jesus says in John 15, there can be no greater act of love than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us because of his love. Now, he laid down his life that he might sanctify us, that he might take away our guilt through his sacrifice, that he might apply this redemption to us by the washing of water with the word. By the way, remember what I just said about Luther and his view of baptism. You add the water to the word and the waters of baptism become something that can wash away your sins. I can see what Luther would have to say about this. But that's not what Paul is teaching here because if it was, Again, Paul would have never said, I thank God that I didn't baptize any of you, okay? So that you wouldn't say you were baptized in the name of Paul because Jesus didn't send me to baptize. He sent me to preach the gospel. How could anybody say that if they really believed in baptismal regeneration? You would have to say, I thank God I baptized all of you because God used me to save you through that ordinance. Well, that's not what he said because that's not how it is. So he applied this redemption to us by the washing of water, not baptism, but through what baptism represents, the washing of regeneration by the Holy Spirit. This is the application of what Jesus Christ has done. And then he sanctifies us personally through the Word as the Spirit of God takes the Word and applies it to us. But here's what I want us to notice first of all. His goal was that he might present us to himself without spot or wrinkle, holy and blameless, in all of our glory, okay? That is, in perfection. That is what Jesus came into the world to accomplish, okay? That was his goal. 
And so this is what we are also to pursue, to become what it is that Jesus came into the world to make us. Now, Paul goes on in this passage, or I should say, in this passage, he's already shown us how we are to go about this, to be the kind of church that he desires, to be holy, pure, loving, both towards God and our neighbor. Okay, well, what do we need? Well, we need what he's already given us, of course. We need for him to come into the world and do the work he's done. We need for him to apply that work to us, but there's work we need to do. And that work is taking what God has given us in His Word and putting it into practice, okay? Now, we need to know how to pursue this, how to love as God would have us to love, and that's why He gave us His Word. Now, last week we saw how important the fundamentals are, remember? We, we need to believe these truths and trust in Jesus Christ to be justified. But we also noted that that doesn't mean that everything else he says in his word is not important, okay? That everything he says is important. Jesus gave us his word to purify us, to show us how to live, to show us how to serve him, to show us how to love him. And the better we understand this, the better we'll be able to do what he calls us to do. Now, the Ten Commandments, I think you understand, are particularly important. You know, they first show us where we have fallen short of the love that he calls us you know, to, to love, the standard. And that is to point us to Jesus Christ in order that we might have his forgiveness. Paul writes in Galatians 3.24, The law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But that's not the only reason he gave us the law. They also show us how to love. Paul writes in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For he who loves his neighbor has fulfilled the law. For this, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it is summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And again, we're just simply reminding ourselves of what we've known many, many, or heard many times. And that is that what's behind the commandments is that we love. We've got to make sure that we don't understand the commandment to love, to love in the way we want to love. But that commandment is to love in the right way, according to God's word, according to his commandments. Well, the Spirit of God gives us the power to do this. But this is why the Lord has given to us His Word, is so that we can understand how He would have us to love. Everything is connected to that principle. That's why we need to read the Word of God, okay? It's not enough to just hear it. We need to be in it constantly because we often forget what it is we know. And there's many more things we have yet to learn. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, 2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the Word so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. We need also to hear it explained. We need to hear it applied by those that he's appointed the church to do. Uh, Paul writes in Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, and he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And he goes on to say, so that we won't be tossed here and, you know, here and there by every wind of doctrine, so that we'll be settled in the truth. But, you know, again, it's not enough to read it. It's not enough to hear it. It's not even enough to understand it. In order to actually accomplish what Jesus wants to accomplish, we have to apply it. We have to do it. Remember what James says in James 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. The Lord calls us to be perfect. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Okay, so that is our goal, to be perfect as our heavenly Father is perfect. And by the way, that's the reason why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, why we are, you know, given or made partakers of the divine nature, 
is so that we will have the ability actually to do this, at least to some degree. Now, the Spirit of God, we know, does not force us. He doesn't compel us by applying outward pressure, either by other people or by the church, although that is one of the ways in which He will when there's no other way in which we'll listen. He doesn't put the screws to us, so to speak, until we submit. But He changes us from the inside, writing the law on our hearts, giving us the desire to obey by showing us how good His ways actually are. You know, listen to what John writes in 1 John 5, 2. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. That's what the love of God is, okay? That's how we love Him. That's the love He gives to us. But then he goes on to say this, and His commandments are not burdensome. You know, it's not hard to do what you want to do, is it? It's only hard to do what you don't want to do. And um, that's the reason why children ha or parents have to discipline their children and compel them sometimes to do what they should be doing, but that they're not doing. The problem is they really don't want to do it. But you see, that's how we came into the world, not wanting to do it. God solve, solves the problem by giving us the desire to do it, and that relieves us of, of a, the burden which the commandments were before when we didn't want to do it. Now it's our joy to do it. And why Jesus also says on another occasion to take his yoke upon us, the yoke of discipleship, and to follow him. And he says his burden is easy, his yoke is light. And the reason it is is because if you love doing what he calls you to do, then it's a delight to do it rather than a burden to do it. Okay, so he gives us the Holy Spirit to change us from the inside out so that we will pursue what the Lord calls us to to do. This is how we are to strive for personal purity. So there's no question. The Lord calls, He came into the world to make us this way. This is what we are to be pursuing. But as the Anabaptists remind us, we need to be pursuing this not only personally, but also corporately. Corporate purity. Jesus says that we are to achieve this through church discipline. So after we have disciplined ourselves by pursuing Christ's likeness, then we are to help our brothers and sisters do the same thing. If we see someone fall, someone fall away, someone falling into error, an error that is perhaps so serious that it strikes at the heart of the gospel, actually even if it's less serious, if we see them falling into error, we need to try to convince them of the truth. Or if they fall into some sin that they're not willing to turn from. You know Jesus tells us in Matthew 18, we are to go to them privately and try to reclaim them. If they don't listen to us, we are to take one or two more and try to persuade them to turn. And if they don't listen to then the two or three, we are to bring it to the church and let them deal with it. And it may issue in excommunication. Now, this isn't, um, you know, th this is um, not only the way that we are to reclaim brothers and sisters in the Lord if we know the Lord or if they know the Lord. But this is also how we purify the church by removing tares from among the wheat, false believers from the true. This is how we strive for a pure church. Okay, so the goal is purity personally, purity corporately. And we pursue it by God's Spirit and Word within ourselves, and then we try to help one another do it through church discipline. But we do need to remember at the same time that, you know, and I think the Lord tells us this to keep us from despairing because we have a number of setbacks in, in these areas, that we will not reach perfection this side of glory, and we should not expect to. Now, there are those who believe that we can reach Perfection, and not surprisingly, they are called perfectionists. B.B. Uh, Warfield wrote you know, two huge volumes against the idea of perfectionism, but we're going to see from just these few verses that it's impossible. You see, if it were possible on this side of glory to become perfectionists, why would Jesus teach us in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And to do that on a daily basis, because as Sinclair Ferguson pointed out, it's clear the Lord would have us to pray according to this model of prayer every single day. And when he says, give us this day our daily bread, okay, give us today our daily bread, we have to pray that every day. 
Well, in the same way, we have to pray, forgive us. And the reason why we do is because we sin every day. We are not perfect. If we could become perfect, wouldn't somebody in the Christian church have reached that state by this time? I think Paul is arguably the most sanctified man in the New Testament apart from our Lord Jesus Christ and perhaps even in all of church history. And yet he writes in, the, in his letter to the Philippians only a few years before he is martyred, which means close to the end of his life. In Philippians 3.12, Not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. You know, Paul also said in his letter to Timothy towards the end of his life, it's, it's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus has come into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. And again, he wasn't reflecting just on what he had done in the past, not I was, but I am. And I think the closer we get to the Lord in our sanctification, the more we understand sanctification, the more we see how far short we fall of perfection. We do not reach perfection in this life. And then the, I think the death knell to this, if, I have, if this hasn't already done it, if perfectionism were something the Bible taught, why would John tell us in 1 John 1, 8 that if we think we have reached moral perfection, the only thing we have proven is that we really do not know Jesus Christ in the first place. Remember what he says. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I mean, what more do we need to hear? Perfectionism is not possible. So though we are to pursue perfection, we need to remember we're only going to reach it when we arrive in heaven. That's where perfect sanctification takes place. Now, the same thing is true of the church corporately. Uh, and that is, okay, when we're talking about the church, we're talking about something a little bit different. At two levels, there can be impurity. Impure people tolerated sin. We need to deal with that. But also uh, weeding out the tares from among the wheat, you know, getting rid of all the, the people who really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord tells us that's not going to happen either on this side of glory. He tells us in the kingdom parables and it's generally believed that he is referring to the church, that the, the evil one, when, when the, the Lord comes and plants his, his, his uh, field, he plants it with, with good seed, and it's the wheat, but as the wheat grows up, he finds out that the enemy has also gone in and planted tares among the wheat, and that these two, when, when his servants said, you want us to go out and, and, and pull up all the tares? He says, no, let them grow together until the final separation and then the tares will be gathered up and thrown into the fire and the wheat will be gathered into the barn. But if you pull them up now, you may pull up some of the wheat with the tares. You may damage some of those who truly know the Lord. So that's going to be the state of the church from now till the day of judgment. And Jesus also said that many were going to come to him on the day of judgment and they were going to say, you are my Lord. And he will say to them, and I would imagine because they were part of the church, he will say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now, here's, here's the problem with the Anabaptists. Okay? They thought they could have a pure church on this side of heaven, and it only takes one step that the Reformers were not willing to take and that is excluding the children from the membership of the visible church. You know, I, I heard, um, I was listening to a debate between R.C. Sproul, I won't tell you who the other person was, but he, he was a Baptist and he said exactly the same thing. We can purify the church overnight. All we have to do is just, you guys just stop including children. So this, this idea is, is there, okay? Now, we have to, first of all, understand they weren't entirely wrong about how this practice can lead people who are believers to think that their children are not just a part of the visible church. And we have to make that distinction between visible and invisible. There's people who are meeting here, you know, we may be the, a part of the invisible church, we may not be a part of the invisible church. But the invisible church includes everybody who actually is saved. 
this practice can and has led some people, some churches, to believe that their children, because they are somehow included within the visible church through this sign of baptism, to think that they are a part of the invisible church, to think that they actually are saved. I mean, I've met plenty of people like that. We even had some within our own presbytery who believe that all of our children are not only elect, but they are regenerated, they are justified, they are sanctified. I think even one of them said they were glorified. And that that's what they were until, at least, they broke the covenant. Okay? And what they meant by that was they left the church. Now, I remember a dear Christian man who I believe is a sincere believer, whose grandson was killed after he got drunk and drove an ATV into a tree. And he believed that his grandson was with the Lord because his grandson had never broken the covenant. And what he meant by that was he had never left the church because he was still a member of the church. He must certainly be in heaven. But what's wrong with this picture? Why did he get drunk? Why did he drive his ATV into a tree? What, what was going on in this young man's life? Now, if his life had been one of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and faithfulness to the Lord, this, this one incident, you know, this lapse didn't necessarily mean that he wasn't converted. But if that was the pattern of his life, if that's just the way he lived, party up, get drunk, and, and be reckless, well, he couldn't be a genuine believer. Because as we've seen, genuine believers seek to be like Christ, and Christ is not like that. You know, we can't, we can't indulge any sin. We have to put it all off. So lastly, we have to ask this question, how did the reformers get, get around this idea of corrupting the church by including their children? Because remember, they too desired a pure church, and yet they were including children that may not necessarily be converted. As a matter of fact, they believed, depending upon which group, they believe that most of them weren't, you know, that, that child regeneration, infant regeneration was a very, very rare thing, and that most children come to faith later in life once they grow up a little bit. Well, they could only do it by assuming that their children were not converted and doing what the Lord calls all of us to do for our children, which is to evangelize them, to point them to the Lord Jesus Christ, to show them their need of Him and Him alone to save them. Now, I'm sure the Anabaptists did the same thing, pointed their children to Christ, but they thought that the Reformers were not doing that. Now, if the children come to faith, well and good, that's what we desire. But if they don't, well, from a Reformed perspective, they're eventually going to leave. You know, from the Anabaptist perspective, they never come in. But from the Reformed perspective, they're going to leave or eventually they're going to be excommunicated from the church and that's how you deal with, you know, the, the tares. That's how you purify the church. You do it through church discipline. Now, one thing we're going to notice this evening is excluding the children didn't really help the Anabaptist situation at all in their quest for a pure church because they, they had plenty of sin in their own hearts and they did some pretty crazy stuff. If I have a chance, I'll, I'll try to maybe fill in a little bit of what I remember from our church history with what Godfrey is going to share this evening. But he is going to share a couple of the events that uh, led the Reformers again, not just because of their practice. I mean, they could have tolerated that, the idea of this exclusion, but because of the consequences of it, it threatened the Reformation. But again, the, the Anabaptists, they took over a city by, by force. They excluded everybody. They, they reintroduced polygamy. I mean, there's a lot of crazy things they did. They were predicting the second coming of Christ, that, that the new Jerusalem was going to land in, in the city of Munster, you know. So it, it's, um, they were pretty, there was a pretty wild fringe, but that wild fringe, you know, guilt by association, it can taint the whole movement. So we'll see more about that this evening. But to sum up, let's remember this. Our Lord calls us to pursue perfection, personal perfection and corporate perfection. But he also reminds us that we're not going to reach that perfection until we reach heaven. And thankfully, between now and then, because we are God's children through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will not let us go when we inevitably fail him but he will be faithful 
to discipline us so that we will go the right direction. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's, um, let's ask the Lord to help us receive what He has said to us this morning.